very important verse. It is our text this morning, but not just because it's our text, but because it teaches us how to be content in this life. Now, I'm not going to ask how many struggle with being content. I'm not going to ask how many are content. I'm not going to ask how many are not content. I'm going to let you make that decision for your own self. You know the answer to that question this morning. So I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 6 and read down through verse 10. And the Bible gives us how that we can prosper in this life. A lot of people want to know about, well, what can I do to prosper? I mean, prosper uh, is just a word that we all sort of gravitate to. We want to be able to uh, say that we have prospered in this life. I mean, after all, we don't want to be here for nothing. We don't want anything uh, to be in vain. Well, here's what the Bible has to say. Now, if you're a Christian, and many of us are, and I pray that if you're not, that you become one today because it's very important that you do. Uh, The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Every service we do, uh, one of the goals that we have is to bring somebody to the knowledge of coming to know Christ as their personal Savior. So if you're not heaven ready, get heaven ready today. I don't know what you're waiting on. I don't know why the churches are not full today. As bad as the world is and the calamities that we see, If I was an unbeliever, I would hope that I would have enough faith in God to run to the house of God and beg that he would save my soul. We're not going to be here much longer, and I'm fine by that because I'm ready for heaven. Amen? Amen. And so we find that we all like to talk about prosperity. We want what we uh, desire, and uh, those things oftentimes are not what we need. They're more like what we want, but... When we talk about prosperity, it's oftentimes a much different version of what the world says prosperity is. Now, here's what the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and if you are a Christian, that's where I was coming to, back to. If you're a Christian, you believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, and so let's hear what it has to say. But, Paul said, Timothy said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, that is our formula But godliness with contentment, in other words, godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Now, you can't subtract any of those things from this formula and get great gain. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, let's go on to see what Paul has to say about this life. None of these will be a surprise to us. He said, for we brought nothing into this world... And you'll also carry the same amount out. You came naked, you'll leave naked. You came with nothing, and you will leave with nothing. And having food and raiment in this life, Paul says, let us be content. But they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while some... Coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible, and I didn't put this on the screen, and it's not there for a reason. I think sometimes we need to turn in the Word of God and not get so comfortable that everything is just available to us because if we turn in God's Word, we actually feel it, we touch it, we see it, we highlight it, we mark it, and it helps us to memorize it just like Joe. Uh, Jocelyn did this morning. She got up in scripture reading and did not even bring the scripture with her as far as touching it in the tangible Bible that she could have brought up here and read from. She was so confident. Yes, she brought the scripture with her. How did she bring it? It was in her heart. And she memorized it. And what a wonderful blessing that that was. So I want you to turn. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. Or at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, which is a continuation of the text this morning. And the reason I want to do this is because the Bible says, Stay away from chasing after the things the world says will make you happy. In other words, don't chase after money. Money will not make you happy. Don't chase after titles. Titles will not make you happy. Do not chase after more assets. Those things will not make... Don't try to heap up more things. Those things will not make you happy. Well, what does make you content? 
But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after these. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Paul goes on to say, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Wherefore thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Lay hold on eternal life and you can be content. What does it mean to be content? It means to be satisfied. It means to be pleased with what you currently have and the circumstances that you find yourselves currently in. Now, when I read this text this morning, many of you thought, okay, Apostle Paul, we've heard that before. He wrote many of the letters in the New Testament. We know that he was a murderer of Christians, and God called him on the road to Damascus and saved his life, and he went on to do great and wonderful things, and he set up churches, and yes, he did do that, and he mentored pastors. Yes, he did do that. He loved the church. Yes, he loved the church. He prayed for the church. Yes, he prayed for the church. He won many souls to Christ. Yes, he won many souls to Christ. But do you know the one thing that you need to think of right now as we're reading this text in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 where that Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain is that Paul was in prison. And here he is giving you and I a lesson on being content. He was in prison. He was writing from a prison cell where he was being served the worst food imaginable, where he wasn't given a blanket and a cot and told to sleep. He was probably sleeping on the cold, hard ground. And yet here he is telling the church and ultimately you and I today to be content with our circumstances. For he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. There is a song that I have sung all of my life. All of those songs this morning that we sung, the wonderful hymns, I knew out of heart. I didn't have to turn uh, to a songbook. Some of you might not have been around long enough yet, but you'll quickly memorize those. And you'll find yourself humming those songs throughout the week and throughout the day. And they're an uplift to you. They'll do much more for you than what the worldly music of the world will do. Learn the old hymns. They've been around for generations. And they will stick around for many more, I hope and pray. As long as our church is here, they will. Because we will still sing about God's amazing grace. Still sing about victory in Jesus. We will still play the old hymns and sing the old hymns. They've worked for years and they'll continue to work as we rejoice and give God praise. But one of those old hymns that I've known for years is entitled, I'll Be Satisfied. And it says this, when my soul is resting in the presence of the Lord, I'll be satisfied. When my soul is resting in the presence of the Lord, I'll be satisfied. Are you satisfied with your life today? Are you content with the circumstance that you find yourself in? Now, I want to give you three things this morning. They're not necessarily three things in order. You could probably take them and mix them up and they would still, uh, they, would, they would go and fit just right, all right? So it's not any kind of rank and order. These are just th three things that I want to give you about contentment today. And the first one is, know this, that the world has been chasing its tail from the very beginning. Have you ever seen a dog chase its tail? I have no idea why they do that. I don't understand why they do that. I'm sure there's some reason why they do that. But to you and I, as human beings, we look at that dog and say, look at that dumb dog chasing its own tail. And it just spins around and around. Whether it be in your living room or in your yard or out in the street, wherever you see that dog chasing its tail, you laugh at that dog. You may even video that dog or take pictures of that dog. And you say, look at that silly animal chasing its own tail. I mean, after all, if it were to bite it, maybe it doesn't know, but it's going to bite its own tail. Well, the world's been chasing its tail for years. What do we mean when we say that you're chasing your tail? It means that you're doing an activity that at the end 
is not going to produce any value. You're chasing your tail. And the world's been chasing its tail from the very start. How do I know that? Because if Adam and Eve had to be content with their circumstances, they would have never been enticed by Satan to, to take from that which was forbidden by God. Amen? I mean, if they were satisfied, then why take of the forbidden fruit? Because Satan offered that their eyes would be open to more. Well, we always like more. If I told you you could have more this morning, there probably wouldn't be a person in the building that would, take, that would not take me up on that. That's why that we ridicule uh, those establishments that continue to promote that the poor people of our county will come in and put their money at risk and most of the time lose it. Why? Because that is proving to us once again, again, and again, and again, the only reason you would gamble to start with is because you're not content with what you have. Else why would you be there? Amen? I mean, Vegas has established itself as Sin City for decades, and many people go there. It's a tourist attraction, and we go there, we see the bright lights, and we see all of these shows, and we see all of this atmosphere. Uh, and, and you know what that was built on? It was built on discontent. What do you mean it was built on discontent? Because if I'm satisfied with what I have, why would I risk what I have to get more? Amen? And so don't prove to me or don't try to prove to me that you can go to a gas station and pay $5 for a scratch off and yet be satisfied with what you have. It's impossible. Else, why would you go and give five to get more if you're satisfied with the five that you have? You say, Jody, why is gambling a sin? It's because you're envious of wanting to get more and more so you could either be like somebody or you're discontent with what you've currently got that God has given to you. And you are smacking God in the face and saying, I'm going to take what you gave me and I'm going to be discontent with it and I'm going to walk into the BP and I'm going to give $5 to the cashier in hopes that what you, the measly amount you gave me, that I can make more and then I'll be content. And therefore, my friend, it is a sin to take a chance with what God has given to you. Amen? Well, that wasn't the loudest amen of the morning, but it's still the truth. <laughs> The world has been chasing its tail from the beginning. John D. Rockefeller said this, How much does it take to make a man happy? How much money does it take to make a man happy? Now we know that Rockefeller is associated with the riches, one of the wealthiest men of his time, and he said, in, in the response, How much does it take to make a man happy? And he said, Just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. And you get that dollar, how much would it take to make you even happier? One more dollar. And where does the cycle end? The, 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 the deceiver of this world will not let that cycle stop. And so as the world, we are chasing our tail trying to get that one more thing that the devil has entrenched in us that if we can get it then we will be satisfied but when we get it it is a large failure and we are sorely disappointed because when we gain the one more we are no more satisfied than we were before and yet instead of us looking and saying maybe the word of God is right here comes Satan and what is his ploy go get one more and maybe it'll work Go get one more and maybe it'll work. Go get one more and maybe it'll work. Let me give you two verses that prove to us that the world has been chasing its tail for years. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 8 says, All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. We are never naturally satisfied. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. What does these two verses mean? Is that the world cannot provide contentment for you because it will always prove to be a failure. You will never be 
happy. And I've told you this before. I've heard people say it. I've heard people say it recently. If I could get one more dollar on the hour, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. You're not happy with what you've got. If $15 an hour don't make you happy, why would 16 If $20 on the hour don't make you happy, why would 21 I read an article this week that they done uh, research asking if Americans are really content. And one of the lowest points of contentment was with jobs that we have. And it said, un, and I, I don't have the numbers, but I'm just going to give you the, the general concept. It said that most Americans are not happy with their job, but said this, that m- Americans that make over $150,000 a year annually at their job are satisfied. But everybody making less than that predominantly are not content with their job. But can I tell you, and you may think this is, you may think, well, this, Jody, that's not true. Try me. I, can, I, I will say this, that if every one of us in here today, if we all went to work tomorrow and all of your bosses heard me preach and they said, well, I'm going to try it and I'm going to pay all the members of the Willow Fern Baptist Church $150,000 a year starting today and see if they're content. A year would pass and you would have $150,000 in your pocket, but you would be not one ounce more content next year than you are today. Because those things are only hell chasing. And you say, well, let me try it. And you may want to try it, but I'm telling you, the Bible says that our eye is never satisfied with seeing and our ear is never satisfied with hearing. And he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. In other words, if you love money, money will never satisfy you. If you love accumulation, accumulation of things will never satisfy you. You're chasing your tail. You may not believe it, but my friend, it's the truth. And it's a learned experience. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, but let me give you this illustration. I printed this off right before I came over. I thought it was fantastic. I want to be able to get to this point in my life. I I want this to be me. I want to get out of the rat race. I'm only about halfway home as far as retirement goes. I'm only, I still got a long ways to go. And I, I don't dread that in the sense because I still, I enjoy work. I think it's what people ought to do. I know that's a, I know that's a foreign concept today in America, but I believe that people should still get up on Monday morning and go work and put food on the table and not depend on the government to do it. And all the workers said, amen. Well, I got less amens on that than I did on the gambling. So apparently, we've just got a bunch of lazy, deadbeat gamblers in the house this morning. Wasn't the crowd I was expecting. There's a story told of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. And the businessman, why are you not out fishing, he said. The fisherman said, because I've caught enough fish for today. The rich man said, but why don't you go out and catch more fish? The man said, what would I do with them? You could earn more money, he said. You could buy a better boat, a bigger boat, go deeper, and then catch more fish. You could purchase better nets, catch even more fish, and make even more money. And soon you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman then said, well, then what would I do? You could sit down and enjoy life, said the businessman. The fisherman said, what do you think I'm doing right now? What do you think I'm doing right now? See, the world has been chasing its tail, and I don't want you to get involved. I don't want to come to your house and come to your living room and see you chasing your tail. I would laugh at you just as I would laugh at the dog. And I don't want you to look at me, and every time you see me, I'm chasing my tail. 
I mean, do you understand? And I, this is not a this is not a sermon about being late for church. This is not a sermon about being on time for church. But do you remember back way back when? For those of you that have been attending church for a long time, I remember. I do remember these days, and these days are almost long gone. I mean, I'm just a middle age, but I still do remember the time way before the church bells would ring. That people were gathered in church long before that. What were they doing? Pretty much nothing. Why were they there? Fellowshipping, talking, enjoying. Well, how much time are you talking about, preacher? Oh, I remember going to church with my papa, and, and if we were there less than an hour before church, he was late. Well, what was he doing? He was just sitting around waiting on people. One old fella would show up, two or three old fellas would show up. They'd stand around on the porch. They'd shake everybody's hands. They'd come in. They'd talk about work. They'd talk about sports. They'd talk about this, that, and all these other things. And, 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 and yes, they'd probably even smoke a few cigarettes. Because, <laughs> well, we've maybe migrated a little bit in progressing. But still... Where is that now? You know what happens when the church bell rings today and pretty soon we're going to have that. But you know what happens when the church bell rings? We've got cars that are pulling in. I mean, no, don't get in my way. I'm almost late. Some people bump the church, about knock the glass out of the windows. They run in here at 11.07 and say, whoo, that was close. <laughs> and, then, and then at 12, we start thinking about, okay, whoo. When's he going to quit? And we run out of here. We don't talk to anybody. We get in our truck and our car as fast as we can. And we go home. And you know what we in large part do? We go home to do what? Nothing. <laughs> We're in a hurry to go home and do nothing. Where are you going? Nowhere. Well, why are you in a hurry to get there? And I'm guilty of it too. But the rich man said... You could sit down and enjoy life. And the fisherman said, what do you think I'm doing? When was the last time you enjoyed life? I mean, literally, you sat down and just enjoyed it. And I, I'm, I mean, I live in a house to where that's hard to do too. Because there are so many things. But I will say this, that Jesus said, I want you to come to me, everyone that's thirsty. Come you to the waters, and he that hath no money. You don't need money. Jesus said, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? You labor for that which satisfies not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. And it requires no money. But everything good has to be bought. That's foolish. You're chasing your tail. I mean, you are chasing your tail. I seen just just randomly, I, I was on, the, on something yesterday, and, and there was a an actress, they say, she rarely comes out. And, and they had videoed her coming out, and they said, look at her beautiful fall attire. She had on like sweatpants and a t-shirt. And she was packing a purse and they said, it's the new Gucci purse and it cost $3,300. And do you know, and I don't mean to be simple minded here, but do you know that you don't have to have that to be content and even when you get that, you're not going to be content. That's somebody that's chasing their tail. Amen? Amen? I mean, I've went on trips with people before that everybody else was coming in with Louis Vuitton luggage and they had theirs in a black garbage bag. And do you know whose clothes got there the same? Both. The black garbage bag worked just as well as the Louis Vuitton. You say, yeah, but I mean, you don't know what that does for me, preacher, to have that in my hands. No, I do know what it does. You're chasing your tail and I'm laughing at you. Amen? 
Cassie's probably asking for one of those for Christmas. But I just proved to her in the Bible that we don't have to buy that. Thank you, God. She's going to get Ziploc bags and, and 30 gallon glad tie up bags. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with those things? Well, there might be, but at the same time, I, I'm going to say, I'll say this, there may not be anything wrong with it, but you have to make sure that you're not chasing your tail. Thinking that what you're going to go out and buy is going to bring happiness to your life, and you're dead wrong. Because at the end of this thing, you didn't come in with anything. And that's the same amount you're going to go out with. God is the only source of our contentment. Man, I've got to hurry. I'm still on the first page. God is our only source of contentment. That's period. God is our only source of contentment. If you want to be content in this life, you've got to come to know Christ as your personal Savior. Anything outside of that, you will fall short of content. Your life will never be content. It doesn't matter what you do. You can have an Ivy League education. You can have a penthouse suite. You can live, uh, or you can be in an office to where you can oversee everybody else in the corner of the building. But I'm telling you that you will still, when all of that comes to fruition, you will look around and say, I'm still not content. I want you to come back to this day and this verse that says this. Paul said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He says, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound, in everywhere and in all things I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul was not always living in a bed of roses. You know what? When it comes time for pastor's appreciation, this church flowers me with gifts and candy and money and all kinds of things. And I love that month and I don't deserve that month, but you make sure that I get all that I need. And I'm telling you that Paul did not have that. He was a better preacher than I was. He was a better man of God than I was. And yet he was in prison and nobody bought him a gift. Nobody got him candy. Nobody got him a gift card. The church many times have forsaken him and he loved them and depended on them but the offerings quit coming that's why Paul says I have learned in whatsoever state I am in whether I am flourishing or whether I am forsaken Paul says I have learned to be content and so you have to do the same all of us are challenged today by the word of God to go out and be content why well, I'm telling you it doesn't come naturally Look at your children. If you want to know that the human life doesn't naturally be contented, then look, at, no, look no further than your children. I mean, my, the Christmas list that the boys gave me, I don't know who they think we are. But I do like what Shaq told his kids the other day. Some of you might have seen this. Of course, you know he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and he's done that through all kinds of, you know, uh, not only the NBA and his very successful Hall of Fame career in basketball, but through many business uh, adventures and, and investments, and he's just done well. And, and I mean, when I say done well, I mean he's done well hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. You know what he's told his kids? You're not rich. I'm rich. You're not rich. I'm rich. I can't tell my kids you're not rich, I'm rich, because I'm not rich. So quit giving me a Christmas list as if I am. But you know what? I can buy everything on that Christmas list, and we'll try, you know, just like you, you'll go out and you'll try to find these things, and, and you'll put, well, okay, good thing there's children's church, and you put them under the tree, and, and, and you say, okay, blah, 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 and, and you put all these things under there, and you wrap them up, and... That morning doesn't make them one more content with life than the day before. You say, well, why are we buying all that stuff? Because oftentimes we're chasing our tail. Oftentimes we're chasing our tail. There was one man who lived very frugal and depended on the Lord for all that he had and needed. His neighbor moved in and he said as, as his neighbor moved in, he seen all these fancy furnitures being gotten out of the truck. There was the electronic this and the electronic that, all the devices. 
the refrigerators and all the fancy stainless steel and all this stuff just kept, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of things being brought out of the truck. And he was moving in and his neighbor passed by and he yelled at him. He said, how's everything going? They began to stir up a conversation. And, and he talked about moving and all this stuff. And the old frugal guy said, I tell you what I'll do. He said, if you've forgotten something that you think you can't live without, he said, come to me. I'll show you how to live without it. And you know, a lot of times we don't want to live without it. We want to chase our tail. But God is the only source of contentment. Let me give you a verse that is oftentimes misquoted, misused, and misinterpreted. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. One, one preacher said, Paul is not telling Christians to go out and conquer the world. He's reminding them that they can press on when the world conquers them. One preacher even said, and I was reading about this, it, it said, this doesn't mean if you're 5'5 five, five and you can wear a shirt that says Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that you can go out and jump in the gym and expect to dunk. Because you're not. Just because you said, well, God says it tells me I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This is not an ambition to go out and achieve. This is an ambition to be satisfied with the circumstances you're in and the challenges you face. And so a lot of times we look at that as a way to say, well, if we'll win the game, I can do, I can win, I can win, I can win, I can win. I can do all things through Christ. If I'll win, I'll win, I'll overcome, I'll conquer, I'll do all these things in games and competitions and all this. And the spirits uh, that oftentimes that we put on this verse says, I can do all things through Christ, so I'm going to go out there and win the game. What this verse really means is, if you lose, are you still going to be dependent on Christ? For it says, I can do all things through Christ, not only in times of winning, but what about in the times of loss? What about when you don't beat up on the opponent, but the opponent beats up on you? What about when the world doesn't lose, but the world wins and it conquers you? Then you're able to say, as Paul did, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen. Last point. Contentment is a permanent condition unaffected by our surroundings, period. It's a permanent condition, contentment is, or it should be, unaffected by our surroundings. Now, 2 Corinthians gives us a story that Paul came to Christ, many feel like, with a physical infirmity. Some, many think that it was his eyesight, that he was losing his eyesight. And a lot of us know all about that. Peyton come up here this morning, he was sitting with me before church, and he was asking me about what time it was. I said, there's a clock way back there. He said, I can't see that. I don't have my glasses. He's six years old, seven years old. He's got a long way to go. We've got him glasses, but he never knows where they're at. And so he just walks around pretty much blind all the time. <laughs> and his mom said, where's your glasses? And the typical response for Peyton is, I don't know. And he's right. He don't. Many think that Paul had an eyesight problem and it was a thorn in his flesh and he come to God and he said, God, I need you to take this away. I need you to do this. How many of us think that our issues are the most pressing issues to God? <laughs> I, I could pick some of you out. And whatever your circumstances is, you think that's the most pressing circumstance to God. And it's not. And it never will be. Because God didn't put us here to live in a bed of roses. God never made a promise. Hey, you'll go to church, I'll make your week great. No, if that was the case, every week of my life would be great because I'm always here. And many of you are too. But I've had bad weeks. This week wasn't a great week for me. I'll be honest. It was not a fantastic week for some reasons. For some, it was a great week. For some reasons, it was a great week, but there are also reasons that this week I would just about have given it up. Well, what happened? Was God mad at you? No, God wasn't mad at me. Did you do something wrong and deserve God's punishment? Not that I know of. But oftentimes, my friend, life just happens. And when we come to God and we say, God, you should fix this and fix it now. 
And God says, I'm not doing that. And you say, well, why not? You're God. You can. God says, yes, I can, but I won't. And now we're mad. And Paul says, I come to God three times and ask him to take care of my issue. And God says he wasn't going to heal me. What do you mean? Because this was the response that God gave to Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you're weak, God says, the revelation is that that's when I'm the strongest. You'll see God as strongest when you are at your weakest point. And if you're never, if God never allows you to get to that weakest point, then you may never see him at his strongest. You want some testimonies? Ask Marnus about that. You, you see many of you. And you know when you've seen God the strongest is when you were the weakest. And you say, well, I don't want to go there. Well, if you don't want to go there, then maybe, just maybe, you will never see God at his strongest. Because you want to be spoiled. You want everything to be a bed of roses. You want every day to be sunshine. Do you know we may wake up tomorrow and there may be clouds in the sky. Don't look out and say, oh God. Oh, how uh, I can't laugh today. Or adult today. Or some ignoramus quote that some of you say. Get up. We got to go on. It may be the worst day of your life, but that may be when God proves to you that He is stronger than ever. And at the end of it, my friend, live to be content. I, I end with this. Benjamin Franklin said, Content makes poor men rich, and discontent makes rich men poor. You need to take that with you throughout this week. Content makes poor men rich. And discontent makes rich men poor. I, I said that was the last thing, but I, I will read what's in your outline at the end. Even though we can't have all we want, we ought to be thankful for what we <laughs> for for that we don't get what we deserve. We may not have all that we want, but what we ought to be thankful for is that we don't get what we deserve. Because if I got what I deserved, I'd have a far less than what I've got right now. Amen. Go out this week and be content with such things as you have, for such is the kingdom of heaven. That's what the Bible says. Find yourself in a place of contentment. And when you sit down Thursday with the in-laws, be content. You may say, God, you said in my weakest days that you showed me how you were the strongest. You may have to go to the bathroom and say, God, I can't do it. And God may have to say, get out, my grace is sufficient for thee, all right? Enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday. It'll be much more enjoyable if you've got content in your heart. Amen. Stand with us this morning. All